thank you all who sent me uh, notes or emails, text messages, uh, celebrating my ordination uh, last weekend. Um, I'm very, very grateful for that. As you, many of you know, it's a long journey if you've been in the Methodist Church. It took me about 11 years to get through that process, so I just want to public, publicly say thank you to everyone who prayed for me and, and supported me. Uh, thank you. You know, I was reflecting on that experience, and someone asked me uh, recently, uh, what was the ordination ceremony like? What did it mean for you? How did it go? And I reflected on that, and, you know, my response to them was that it was an, an affirmation of what God had already done in my life. It was, it was a simply a celebration of the journey. I had already been walking with God and kind of a continuation of that story. I didn't have time to go into details, um, but there is a story behind my ordination. You know, many of you look at me, and I'll be uh, 30 this year, and I'm not a dad, I know, and I'm, I'm just a baby. I'm just a baby, so wet behind the ears. <laughs> many of you are like fathers and, and grandfathers to me, and um, for, for me, um, you, you might wonder and think, well, well how did he get to where he where he is today, and I'll just say that there is a story. Uh, I can't tell you at all. It, it starts even before I was born. My, my mother and father prayed for me. Uh, my mother uh, had a dream. She asked her, she said she saw my face and she knew that I was a gift from God, so she named me Matt. Later, I was dedicated in a Methodist church in Inglewood, and the pastor said at my dedication, my mom wrote down the words on the back of the bulletin for the dedication service, I'd like to see him become a pastor one day. And, and I, yeah, I'm just a kid, I didn't know any of this. Later in life, I submitted an application to go to Warren Willis uh, summer camp, and I submitted a scholarship because I couldn't afford to go without it. And somebody, one of the pastors on the staff, wrote on the application, I think this one is called into ministry, but I don't know how. And so there's stories like this all through my life. And so you may look at me and go, wow, he's, he's young, but God's been preparing and planning me uh, for, for that ordination ceremony my, my whole life. And so uh, when I look at it, that's just a small snippet. You know, that's just one scene in my life. And I know you all have a story. This church has a story. Uh, this is not the original campus. Many of you know, and if you're just joining us or, or visiting online today, you may not know the story, but we started out in Laurel Nokomis. And then some people wanted to have a retreat center where that was close enough, but away from the, the normal campus where they could go and have revival and kind of have these um, camp meetings. Um, and that's still why we sing those songs, those old songs of praise that you would sing at retreat meetings. And so there's a story there, there's a history there. And if you would have looked at a certain scene in this church's history, you might have seen uh, just palmettos and oak trees out here. You know, back then it would have been crazy to build a church way out here on Center Road. There was nothing out here for those of you uh, who know the story. And so, and then if later, in, you know, later in the story, in the church's history, you might have looked and you might have said, well, you know, the, the church uh, has this chapel and it used to be over there and, and now we need a big one. So now we're going to have to to collect money and do fundraising. And you might have come to the church and said, you know, I don't really see this happening. I don't see how this vision's going to take place. You know, it's crazy to build right now. Construction prices are high or maybe you would have come with a time when we were paying off the mortgage. But now you all are the fruit of that labor and you're sitting here in these pews and, and you're in a sanctuary that's completely debt free, uh, praise God. And, and so people, yeah, thank God for that. So I just, I'm reminded today that there is more to the story than just a scene. All of you have a story. This whole world has a story and really it's God's story. It's the story of salvation and if I was to ask you to tell your stories about how maybe you came to this church, you'd tell me um, that you met a friend that brought you here, or maybe you watched online a couple times during the pandemic and then decided to come when you were vaccinated, or, or maybe you just were driving down the road and you saw the sign and decided to come in. Um, but all of you have a story to tell, and many of you have scenes in your life 
uh, that you don't share. You know, I, I do too. You know, we're not supposed to share everything with everybody. Um, you know, we, for one thing, this sermon would never end. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, it's it, it only appropriate in certain contexts is to, to to discern and share certain stories. So, I'm reminded that our scene. Whatever scene we're in right now, whatever stage of life we're in, is not our story. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, there's more to the story. And then tell them there's more to my story. So the Israelites have a story. I, I mentioned that uh, we are part of a larger story the story of salvation, God's story. Really, God's the author and perfecter of this story. He's the hero in the play. But the story, if you haven't heard it, goes something like that. Once upon a time, there was a man named Abraham, and God called Abraham to leave his home, to leave his country, and go to a land in which God would show him. Abraham said yes. And so he left with his wife and his brother and some of his possessions, and he went to this land that God would show him. And because Abraham obeyed and stepped out in faith, God said, I will bless you. I will bless you with many, many children. Look up at the sky and see the stars, and that is how many children you will have. You will have more children than the grains of sand on Venice Beach and beyond. And so Abraham believed this promise, even though him and his wife were past birthing age, and he became a father. And then through his lineage came the nation of Israel. And God said that all nations, the entire world, is going to be blessed through you and through your family. But for hundreds and hundreds of years, this promise didn't come to fruition. In fact, the Israelites were in slavery to Pharaoh for 400 years plus after that. And then later, after the Israelites are freed, they eventually have their own nation, but life isn't perfect. They have wars, they have battles against other surrounding peoples, and eventually they're taken into exile, captivity by a foreign country, by Babylon, and then again by Assyria. Their temple is destroyed, the nation is destroyed, and the people are scattered once again, without a land, without a home. And then many more years go by, and we hear the story of a, a young girl named Mary who was told by an angel that she was going to have a baby who was going to fulfill that promise made to Abraham all those centuries ago, and that his name would be Jesus, meaning Savior. And Jesus was born of that virgin. He taught he showed people the love of God. He preached about the kingdom. He healed the sick. He healed the mute. He healed the deaf. He made the lame to walk again, the blinded eyes to see. And then he was crucified because he loved so radically. And he was innocent. And he died on a cross. And he was buried. But... In three days, he rose again, and God proved that Jesus was who he said he was. He was the Son of God, the King of kings, and Lord of lords. And then he taught his disciples some more, and then he said, I'm going to a place to prepare a home for you. And you can't go with me yet, but one day I will return, and I will make all things right, and I will sit on the throne not only of the current heaven, but the new heaven and the new earth, and there's going to be a new order. And it's going to be one without pain, without suffering, without any crying or tears. It's going to be a perfect place of love, and all of our friends and family will be there. That's the story. That's the story of salvation. That's my story. That's your story. That's the story of the world. It's God's story. But if you were to look at any point in Israel's story, if you were to take a scene out of the Bible, you might find them in slavery. You might find the people of God crying out for a savior. You might find them in exile, in captivity. You might find them in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, you might find that they are in front of the Red Sea. 
And the story this morning, the couple verses that we are going to read is just that. It's a snippet, it's a scene out of this greater story. And so turn with me to Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 18. You can follow along on the screens. And this is the scene that we hear today. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was the shorter way. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed and ready for battle. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Oh, Father God, we thank you for this scene in the Bible, but help us to put it in context of the larger story. Help us too to remember that this scene that we may find ourselves in today is not the whole story. So Lord, we give our story to you. We ask that you would keep writing your story on our hearts and minds. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You know, stories are powerful. Uh, when I was younger, I was all about logic and science and rationale. So if you listen to my early sermons, uh, there were no stories. It was very, very dry. As I've grown in my preaching, as the Lord has shaped me, I'm realizing the importance of storytelling and what stories do for us. See, each of us have our own story in our minds, a narrative that we play over and over again. And some people get stuck on one scene in their story. I've learned from counseling and pastoring throughout the years uh, that so often we will remember uh, one scene and we will replay it over and over and over and over again. Sometimes it's just the highlight reels. Sometimes we only tell people about the good times in our life, when God blessed us, when we had plenty, when we had more than enough, when things were always going our whole way. We hear a lot of times um, sermons or, or testimonies about that, and that's wonderful, but it's not the whole story. On the other end, sometimes people get stuck on a negative scene in their life, something that may have been only 15 minutes of their life and happened 15 years ago. You know what I'm talking about? You know, <laughs> see, so you shake it. And we, and we replay that story over and over and over and over and over again. And we let it define us and define our entire story when really that's just one scene. It is not the entire story. In my own life, I can look back at the hills and the valleys, the kind of ups and downs of our life. See, circles, or excuse me, stories are circular, aren't they? They're not linear, they're not a straight line. There's no story uh, if it's all good times. Think about your favorite novel or TV show or movie. It starts out with a hero, right? And then the hero has to face some kind of trial, uh, some kind of villain, some kind of crucible before it reaches a, a clean resolution. Why is that? because that's how life works. Our lives are not good and happy all the time, nor are they bad all the time. And looking back on my life, I can kind of look at these ebbs and flows, these ups and downs and say, the Lord was with me through it all. Through it all, he was there. And the valleys don't seem so low and the mountains don't seem so high because I know either way, the Lord has, has blessed me and he keeps me and he provides for me. The Israelites are still learning this story and they find themselves in a scene in which could have been very confusing to them. Just imagine, the people are following Moses out of slavery. They've been there for 400 years. They remember the promise of God that they are going to a promised land. And that's what Moses tells them. Read chapter 13 through, it says, you know, the land that's flowing with milk and honey. That's the story. That's where they're headed. Headed. That's the vision that they're given. And now they find themselves faced with a choice. They're following Moses, and Moses is following God. And God says to Moses, go left, and Google Maps says go right. <laughs> God says, don't take the short path that goes straight to the promised land, the land of Cana, the land flowing with milk and honey. Go this other way. 
And scripture actually says that God led them around by the desert road. That word around in the Hebrew literally means in circles. God led them in circles. And I can just imagine the people following Moses and Moses following God and they're thinking, where are we headed? Well, I think we just passed the same dune 15 times. <laughs> and they're headed back to where they came and then they're headed back to the Red Sea and then back towards Egypt. And God's leading them by a pillar of cloud by day and, and fire by night. That's called a theophany, right? Mike mentioned that. It's when the physical appearance of God manifests in creation and nature. And so God is leading them what seems to be astray. And they have a choice. Will they choose to listen to God or will they go their own way? And in life, I think that is the same choice that we have to make, especially when we find ourselves in those dark scenes of life, when we find ourselves struggling to find faith to believe in God's promises, when we're wondering, God, why haven't you showed up in this moment? It's been years, maybe not 400, but maybe it's been 10, 20, 30 years, and you haven't showed up. And it seems like I'm just wandering around in circles. How many people sometimes feel like they're just going around in circles? Anybody? <laughs> just me? All right. It seems like that up and down feeling my spouse's health is getting better. The cancer's going away. Up, oh, it's back again. Up, oh, now we got a good report. Up, oh, another bad report. My son seems to be walking closer with the Lord. Oh, now it seems like he's struggling again with his faith. What are those things that just keep replaying over and over and over again? And the Israelites, they have a choice. Will they go the direction God has called them to go? Or will they choose the shorter path? I think in life, if you follow the Lord long enough, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Lord at some point will do something in your life and he will tell you to do something that's completely illogical. Doesn't make sense to anybody out there. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. And you know that people are going to think you're crazy if you go on that path. I encourage you, do it anyway. It may seem like to others you're just wandering around in circles in the wilderness, even though Google Maps tells you one way, and God says, go the long way. Take the long way. Take the detour. We were in Utah. My family was in Utah. Um, first time I saw snow as a kid, I was in middle school, maybe uh, sixth or seventh grade. My brother was a couple years younger than me, and my sister uh, was there as well, and we're traveling back from our first skiing trip and we're headed back to the hotel. We're going to Ohio next to see um, some of my dad's side of the family that still lives up there. And so we're on this trip, right? And we're coming back, and I couldn't tell you what road it is, but it's a, a large interstate, and it completely comes to a halt. Dead stop. Now, this is before Google Maps, and so we don't know how bad the traffic is. Is it going to uh, you know, lighten up or continue this way? And we just figure, well, we don't know really any other way back to the hotel. This is the road we came on. This is the road we're returning on. Odds are this traffic is going to lighten up sometime. Well, while we're sitting in traffic, a man comes out of nowhere, walks up to our car, and taps on the window while we're at a, a, a standstill. We roll down the window, and uh, my mom leans out, and he asks us, you know, I saw you had a family and just wondered where you're headed. And we explain, well, we got a flight out tomorrow, and we're trying to get back to the hotel. And, and he said, you know, I wouldn't stay on this road. I would take this exit. And we were almost past the exit at this point. We would, had to make kind of a legal turn to get off onto the exit at this point. And he said, I would, I would get off here, and there's another road you can take, and that should get you to where you're going. And so we listened to the man. The, the traffic started moving again, and so my dad turned off and took that exit. We got home super late. It you know, took another two hours to get back to the hotel. It was the long way around. But in the morning, before we left for the flight, my dad checked the news, and the, live from the helicopter, they were still in a standstill traffic on that interstate. There had been a semi that had overturned or something with fuel in it, and there was a fire. It was too hot to even put out. 
and people were stuck on that road all night without food, water. We would have missed our flight. We would, you know, we, kids that age, we would have been crying and hungry with nowhere to go to the bathroom, and it, it could have been awful. And I remember that still to this day, that even though that seemed like the illogical route, God gave us a messenger to tell us to go another way. As we go through this story, and we read on, we have one of these unique moments in the Bible where we not only hear about the detour that God takes them on, we also get to hear about the reason. Wouldn't you like to know the reason in your life for the detours? <laughs> so many times we don't get that insight into what God is thinking, but in this, this instance, we do. It says, for God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. In other words, God saved them from them, from themselves. God knew that they were not ready to accept that challenge of defeating the Philistines yet. At some point, God would give them victory over the Philistines. They would go to war with them, but it wasn't time yet. He knew in the Israel's hearts and minds that if he would have said, go now, ready as you are, armed for battle, go and fight this people, that they would get discouraged and they would return home. You know, I, in my life, I can see how God has been very gentle with me in helping me say yes to him and giving me exactly what I needed to hear in those moments, the perfect amount of challenge with the perfect amount of grace to give me the best chance of saying yes to him. And when I was younger and I had my call to ministry when I was 17, I felt very strongly it was a call to pastoral ministry. And now I found myself in the Air Force Reserves as a chaplain. And I look back on my life and I can remember my parents uh, would just very graciously and, and very gently put um, chaplain pamphlets on the breakfast table that had come in the mail. <laughs> and, and I always thought, no, that's, that's not me. That's not what I feel called to do. See, I, you know, I, I must confess, then I had a stigma about military life. I thought, you know, everything was very, you know, structured, but also it was, it was all about war and battle and um, that there was just a certain mindset that I didn't want to have, a certain lifestyle that I didn't want to be involved in. And see, that's another example of taking a scene out of a story and how often we do that with people. We take a scene, we see a, you know, a, a man, a Mexican man cutting grass in our neighborhood and we take that scene and we put a whole story around it, don't we? Or we see a, a fancy a car on the street with a, a lady wearing a suit and we put a whole story around that person, don't we? When that's just one scene of their life. So in this instance, I was not ready to accept the challenge of Air Force ministry. The Lord knew that. And if you would have looked back on my life as a 17-year-old, I would have told you, nope, I never, never would ever do military chaplaincy. But the Lord prepared me through, through my life, through experiences that I had to trust him explicitly, explicitly. And so when I got to seminary, there was a booth with a table with a chaplain recruiter. And I just went over to say hi and to thank him for his service. And, my, and the Lord had already warmed my heart towards military people by that point. And uh, he said, why don't you think about military chaplaincy? There's this reserve program. You don't have to be active duty. And at that point, I still said, I don't know. That's not really for me. And he said, why? What is it that's keeping you back? And that's when I prayed about it and sought the Lord and said, Lord, is this my preference? Or is this your purpose? And the answer I got was, it's my purpose for you to serve these people. You've been given the gifts for this. You have experience that will, they will relate to. You can serve them. And so even today, I, I remember that when we look at life and we look at the challenges that God gives us, when we come to those forks in the road, we must remember to pray and ask, Lord, is this my preference or your purpose? And he will show you when we are fully surrendered what his purpose really is. And his purpose for the Israelites was good news for them. Even though they only had that scene, 
only though the GPS said to go right and God said to go left, even though it seemed like they were wandering around in the desert for days on end, they, they then got to see that their detour was their deliverance. See, God knew that when the Israelites were marching out in the wilderness, that Pharaoh's army was gonna be soon behind them. They had no idea. They thought they were free and in the clear. They couldn't see if they would have went through the Philistine country, if they would have went armed and ready for battle as they thought, that they would not have been able to defeat a Philistine army in the front and the Egyptians coming on them on the rear. They would have been trapped and outnumbered and they would have allowed themselves to surrender and be taken back to captivity. God put the obstacle of the Red Sea in their path so that he could use it to deliver them out of Egypt. And so here comes Pharaoh's army, and I encourage you to read it in chapter 14. Here they come, hot on the heels, with their chariots and their horsemen, ready for battle. And here Moses is leading the people, and he leads them to a dead halt right into the Red Sea. And they start to complain and get bitter and go, why, Lord? Why, Moses, why did you lead us out here just to die at the hands of Pharaoh? We would have been better off living in slavery than to die out here in the wilderness. And then, of course, Moses prays to God, and God says, stick your staff in the ground, and he splits the Red Sea, and the waters turn into walls miles high, and the Israelites walk through on dry ground, and their detour becomes their deliverance. And of course, you know the rest of the story, Pharaoh's army comes in after them and God shuts the gate. And the Israelites are free. Now, they have another scene coming. They have another valley. You know that they wander around in the desert for another 40 years, continuing to lack the faith that they needed to go into the promised land. They see giants at one point and they get scared. And then eventually Joshua comes, and Joshua is with the new generation of Israelites. And he says, the Lord told me that if we walk around the walls seven times, Jericho is going to fall, and we're going to have victory. Again, another illogical thing to do. <laughs> but they walk faithfully seven times around the walls, and they shout, and they blow their trumpets, and the walls come crashing down, and the Lord makes good on his promises. And they realize that their detour was their deliverance once again. And the scene that they found themselves in in the wilderness was not their story. And this cycle continues and continues and continues. And here we are sitting today. And I just want to remind you that your scene is not your story. There's more to the story. God's not done with you yet. He has a plan and purpose for you. You may be in a detour. You may feel like you're in the wilderness for miles and miles and years and years, but God makes good on his promises. And you are sitting here because God makes good on his promises. You are the chosen people. You are the ones called by God to show the light to the nation now, to include other people in this story so that they too can experience that God makes good on his promises. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so grateful just for that reminder that the detour oftentimes is our deliverance. For the reminder that this scene that we find ourselves in is not the entire story. There's more to the story. See, the crucifixion was not the end of the story. The devil may have had a party on Friday and the devil may have rejoiced on Saturday morning, but on Sunday, on Sunday, you rose, Jesus, and you proclaimed the victory for all who believe in you. So Lord, we just proclaim that again, once and for all over our story that, Lord, you have the final say, and we allow you to rewrite our story however you see fit, trusting that we won't take the shortcuts. We will take the long way around, 
if that's what you want for us, knowing that you use all those things for your glory and for our good. So Lord, we rejoice in you. We give you praise on this Father's Day. Thank you for truly being a perfect and good father who knows what's best for their children. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.